The following program is presented by the Metropolitan Library Service Agency. Welcome to All About Kids, a program focusing on the interests of children and young people and some of the issues affecting them. Quality health care and insurance benefits available to women and their young children is a subject of concern in Minnesota. Our guests today are Senator Mike Freeman, Democrat from Richfield, who has assumed a leadership role in maternal and children's health issues in the Minnesota Senate, and Dr. Ed Ellinger, Director of Personal Health Services with the Minneapolis Public Health Department. Mike and Ed, we're delighted to have you on All About Kids today, and we're here to talk about some of the issues concerning children and women and health issues. And since we're at the start of a new decade, Mike, why don't you give us a little perspective on what you've seen in the last eight years as a state senator? Well, Gretchen, I think what we've tried to do in the Minnesota legislature is, frankly, to fill some of the holes that were left uh, by the federal government moving out of programs for for women and children and also to fill some of the programmatic holes that even if the federal government had done it. For example, the state of Minnesota is one of the first states to help fund the WIC program, the Women, Infant and Children program, which provides needed uh, education but also nutrition supplements to uh, pregnant women and to uh, children in their first couple of years of, of life. And uh, that's been an exciting and that's been a new innovation. In the healthcare area, I think we really move forward on a lot of Places. We've moved in the Children's Health Plan to making sure that people who are up, up to 185 percent of poverty are covered um, and basically made a good start in providing the kind of medical support for pregnant women and children that they ought to have. Well, you know, you could look at the things that have been accomplished and then you look at kind of the statistics that are going on in the state now over the last 10 years and the Urban Coalition saying that more kids are hungry now than ever before. <clears throat> looking at the studies that have done by the, the health care campaign in Minnesota that's saying that more kids are uninsured now than ever before, rising level of poverty. Uh, you know, how, how do we balance off what's actually happening with some of the programs that you're talking about? You know, what, why is there such a gap between what we do and, and what needs to be done? Well, the economic <coughs> policy of this country, which again is primarily driven by the federal government, has put additional resources in the hands of our senior citizens, frankly, at the direct cost of, of our children. Uh, the increased poverty of our kids has just, just gone up, and people estimate it's anywhere between 20 and 30 percent. Um, what we tried to do in Minnesota is to fill holes for the folks most in need. For example, um, uh, I think the Children's Health Plan is designed to provide health care at a, at a, for children at a higher percentage of income than it is for adults. The idea is kids are most in need and if you're healthy when you're younger or you have the kind of preventative health, you're going to do better later on. So I think we've moved into that. Uh, we haven't done enough and we've got more to do, but if you look in terms of evaluating the decade of the 80s, I, s I think what you've seen is the federal government back off of its commitment, provide fewer dollars, uh, scale back their programs, in the state, particularly the state of Minnesota, increasingly getting involved with new programs and new dollars. Do you see that the state is the appropriate place to have those efforts, particularly related to health care and, and overall nutrition, or do you see that as kind of a fallback mechanism because the, uh, the federal government hasn't played the role it should be playing? I think it's a role of the federal government. A child, a healthy child here, can go on to be a productive citizen in New York State or in Texas or California, wherever. In the same fashion, a child in Texas or Alabama, Louisiana, where they don't have nearly the programs we do, who comes and moves to Minnesota, an adult, has major health problems, can't work, ends up on medical assistance, we, the Minnesota taxpayers, pay for it. So I think it's a federal government, and, and it's been very frustrating to lots of us to see the federal government just kind of move and evolve right out of it. Now, there is some hope with the so-called peace dividend, and hopefully the federal government, you know, with its new word, maybe it's going to start to fund Head Start and wick the way it ought to be. 
but the clear need is there. The need has gotten larger, as you said, Ed, and, and, and we need to, to move forward on that. Mm -hmm. Did you see that the, the state is kind of bailing the federal government out? Absolutely. I mean, there's no question that the state has been doing what the federal government has refused to do. And a number of states, and we get the argument where taxes are high and we spend too much money, the fact of the matter is this state and its citizens, a general consensus that particularly children, pregnant mothers and children, uh, up to age five, just ought to have the basic nutrition and the basic health care. I mean, that's just something we ought to do. If those kids are going to be productive citizens, they just got to have it. And Ed, you know better than I because you see it every day, but I've seen so many examples. If you get an earache early, the child goes on and moves forward. If that earache gets bad, they can lose hearing and sense of balance and impact their, their education. It's real critical in those early years. If we ought to do it, why haven't we done it? Well, I think we've moved forward in this state. And as I said, in those programs I've talked about, we've moved forward in Minnesota. We've got some holes left. In a 1990 session, I'll be introducing a bill which I hope will fill the programmatic holes. We'll take care of both nutrition and health care for pregnant moms and kids up to age five. And therefore, if people search out these programs, they will receive the basic health care they must have and some nutritional supplements. So when a child starts school, he or she will at least have the, the basics. I think we can fill the programmatic hole. The big issue, which you haven't asked, but I can hear it coming from <laughs> both of you, is are we going to fund it? And that's a question whether this state and its citizens have the commitment to our youngest citizens. I think we've shown in this state a marvelous commitment to our older citizens and the huge amount of money we spend in nursing home care for our senior citizens. Now we've got to make the same kind of policy choice, and we've got to say we'll do it for our kids. And I think we will. And when it's put on that kind of basis, I've found legislators, even the most conservative ones, willing to say we've got to find the revenues to help our kids. I want to go back to something you just said about searching out the health care programs that meet the needs. With a changing demographics and increasing population that perhaps doesn't read as well, maybe doesn't even speak English too well, how are we going to make sure that the people who are most at risk and most in need find the program? Well, let me give you an example. In the Phillips neighborhood in Minneapolis, the Way to Grow program, and the TLC, Tender Loving Care Program, have combined to do outreach. They basically got home workers that go from house to house finding pregnant women who aren't knowledgeable about programs. You say, well, why don't these people come forward? Frankly, in many cases, these, these are young women, you know, teenage moms, who frankly, there's been stories they don't know how to make a salad, they've never had one. They've lived on McDonald's types of things, they've never learned it from their own parents. They're bringing them out. They're helping them with the WIC program get the kind of basic nutrition and the education they need, the basic prenatal care that's so critical. And by doing that in a fairly modest expenditure, they're giving both the pregnant mom and the child to be the kind of chances. I mean, if we're going to make commitments to people, you know, we've got to make a commitment to all our kids. And, and those of us who are fortunate to be brought up in middle-class households with warm beds and trips to the doctor and milk every morning, just have a hard time thinking that people right here in our cities within you know viewing distance of this library and the, the IDS Center aren't getting that. And we got to do something about that. that. That's the kind of program that works. Yeah. Well, you bring up an interesting thing. The kind of things you're talking about are kind of public health oriented programs, kind of prevention oriented, kind of community based programs. And yet what we really rely on in our culture is the medical care system. Know, get reimbursement for care of acute illness and, and care of treating diseases and fixing things as opposed to preventing them. How are you going to kind of deal with some of these things that moms and kids need, basically preventive services that won't be covered by insurance? Well, part of it, Ed and Gretchen, we're going to save money. When you talk about the home worker that finds the pregnant woman who's undernourished, that child is born, as you know, at two to three pounds versus six to seven. The, the, the medical needs of that child and, and their early life is much higher than the, the child who is healthier and has a higher birth weight. We go out and we reach out and we can teach these moms how to eat, and the need to, to milk, we, you know, to have milk and drink milk themselves. We can teach them some of the basic sanitation and nutrition things they need to know. What we do is we spend a little bit of money now, we save it a lot down the road, a little bit like some commercials we've seen a few times, except now we're talking with human beings. And those folks who express, as I think most of us do, a real desire to help our fellow man and woman, 
Well, how much more important to help our fellow child mm -hmm. and to get in there and do that. These programs, by getting the basic prenatal care, you get it up front, you save a whole lot of money down the, down the road. It brings up another point. It's coming from Minneapolis and dealing with you know, the Phillips neighborhood and, and a lot of the problems in the city. Yet Minneapolis is a, an anomaly in s some way in the state in that it's a very rural state and we have very urban kinds of problems and dealing with the issues of moms and kids has become very political. And how do you balance the needs of two diverse communities like that, the rural parts of the state of Minnesota and, and Minneapolis, St. Paul with the real urban problems and politically then how do you sell programs that can meet the needs of moms and kids in both of those areas? Well, one of the things we find, particularly in rural areas, is the lack of physicians who are willing to continue to provide pregnancy and birth services, OBGYN services, um, because of the, the low reimbursement rate for medical assistance. One of the things I'm talking about in the legislature I'm bringing is, is to increase the OBGYN reimbursement rate, bring it up so the doctors can afford to do it. Secondly, for people who do a considerable number of medical assistance patients, those people at the lower economic brackets which are essentially paid for by public dollars, we're going to provide some discounts on their medical malpractices insurance. We're going to try to bring the cost, the cost side for those doctors down so they can provide the services. What we're hearing in rural areas is frankly a lack of availability of services. And when that word gets out, then the mother is less likely to get prenatal services, less likely to get the nutritional information, less likely to approach serious problems early. To be honest with you, the middle class family living in Minneapolis or the Hennepin County suburbs, frankly, doesn't need, in most cases, the same number of prenatal visits or the same amount of education because they've learned that within their family. These other folks, be they urban or rural, haven't learned that. And if they don't get that, and if they don't get the care early, we pay a whole lot more down the road. So it's really a cost saver. Mm -hmm. I know that the uh, uh, National Institutes of Health have recently done a study on prenatal care and they made that point exactly that people who are, are well nourished and have their pregnancies planned and get good medical care, they really don't need as many prenatal care visits as have been the routine. They need markedly fewer, but the people who are high risk really do need a lot more and they need a lot more up front, right at the beginning as opposed to right at the end where you can make some changes related to drug use and uh, you know, stress reduction and working conditions and, and nutrition and all of those things. And if folks would stop for a minute and put themselves in perspective of a 15 or 16 year old woman who realizes she's pregnant. Now we can talk about whether she should be pregnant or not, but the fact of the matter is a lot of those young women find it. Then they have to go through a whole question about whether they give birth to that child. They've gone through that, but they've spent a period of time the denial that they're pregnant and they're missing critical times for, for nutrition and for prenatal care. We need to reach out to those folks and if they make that decision to bear that child and to give birth to that child, they've got to make sure they give that child a chance. You go to children's health centers, you've done lots of times, doctor, and seen the one and a half and two pound babies for, you know, versus the seven, eight, nine pound robust, healthy. I mean, it's, the, the little ones just don't have the same kind of chance in life. And those folks, we're going to be providing some kind of services for from day one until that person dies. Well, far better to spend some money, do the outreach work, teach the young woman. The young woman knows how and sees the opportunities to help that young child and give that child a real chance in the world. You know, we've gone a long step to solving one of our major social problems. If you even take a step back from that in terms of prevention, it's been shown that probably one of the in fact, one of the major contributors to decreasing infant mortality, increasing birth weights, is family planning services. And I know that the, the state has made some commitment to family planning through the family planning special projects that comes through the Minnesota Department of Health, but that's really a drop in the bucket compared to the needs of, uh, of moms and kids and, and needs of, of women in the reproductive age group in the state. What's the, legislators, the legislature's position on, on trying to get more money out into the family planning, which is a real prevention kind of approach? The legislature, like society, I think, has been all wound up on the whole issue of abortion. And it's gone back and forth. And any time the word family planning is mentioned at the legislature, the next word is abortion. I think they're separate issues. I think they're issues that we ought to look at differently. Family planning is having the knowledge of one's own reproductive capacity and responsibility and deciding when or when not to, to, to bear children. 
And that's a two-person responsibility. And unfortunately, too often we place it merely on the mother and not enough on the father. I think we ought to do more than that. Not to uh, promote promiscuity, but to so people have some understanding of what they, what, what they do and what, they can, what happens when they do something. I mean, anybody who steps back and remembers what they knew or thought about at age 12, 13, 14, ought to have some place where they get the right answers. And learn it in the locker room behind the garage ain't the right place. And I think we all agree about that. And I think we've tried to do some things in the family planning area. Some folks feel that that's promoting promiscuity and promoting things that we don't want to do in this state. I disagree. And I think there's people on both sides of the abortion issue who do. Frankly, your efforts and some of those of others in terms of trying to help us separate those issues and move forward in a responsible is much needed. And, and, and we need help from the citizens to say, basically, those are two separate issues. Yeah. Well, we've certainly seen that in our, our school-based clinics, the clinics that we have in the Minneapolis public schools dealing with adolescent health services. I mean, you know, we don't <clears throat> talk about abortion in terms of, you know, uh, condoning or even, you know, we try not to, to deal with that issue because of the kind of funding that we get. But we do deal with family planning as a separate issue. And, and kids are sexually active, whether we like it or not, and really have to deal with that. And by helping them make good choices, we can certainly reduce some of the problems of infant mortality, low birth weight infants, unwanted pregnancies, uh, the things that are really going to make a difference in, in our state in long term. And, and having medical professionals like yourself separating those issues help public policymakers. I believe they're separate. I think a lot of folks are. But unfortunately, sometimes there's a particular language that occurs in politics and, 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 and at the state capitol and elsewhere. And, one equals the other, and that's not necessarily so. We see it in the federal government. I mean, what is the federal government doing holding up family planning services for countries overseas who desperately need, desperately need some basic education on it? And, and, and that, that doesn't make much sense to me and to most folks, but that's kind of where we've gotten, and we need to work out, and we need reason to people to say, okay, people can disagree on the issue of abortion. Let's not cloud the question about appropriate family planning with that issue. We need level heads to be stepping forward on this debate now, on this discussion now, and trying to do that. And hopefully, programs like this will help do it. Public library is also a good place to go for information on family planning and Gretchen, sex education. Gretchen, we would be disappointed <laughs> if we hadn't had a plug for a library. I had to put that in. One of the things I'm really interested in, Mike, is the coordination between early childhood development issues, or early childhood family education programs, the public health issue, other programs that promote the well-being. Is the legislature looking at any way that participants in those various programs can somehow be pulled together, head start funding? It seems like every little group is over there fighting for its own little pot of money, and the diversity is, is creating problems for all of us. I wish I had a light at the end of the tunnel. I think one of the things that at least I'm trying to do this session is to, to, to bring it together, to, to recognize we're getting very close in this state to having the programs and the outreach capacity to, me, to, to realize the goal that every pregnant woman and every child from birth to age five will have access to basic nutrition and the basic health care they need. We're very close to that in the state. The next issue we have is, are we willing to fund it? We've done, as I've said, better than most. And there's the argument people will say, well, if we provide those kind of services, then people from all over the United States will come here and, and, and sit in our tax dole to do it. Well, number one, I don't think they're going to do that. And there's no decent evidence to say that that's occurred. That's kind of an easy answer. But the larger question is the one we talked about earlier. The federal government ought to be involved more deeply. And, and, and that we ought to just decide that if for no other reason than just a mere social investment, we ought to make it. Now, most of us have a whole lot more reason to do it than just a mere social investment. These are kids. These are human beings. Nothing was greater to me in my life than watching the birth of my twin daughters and then my boy and the time I get to spend with them. And I think most parents feel that way. We need to translate that into public policy at the state capitol and, frankly, into our checkbook. And I think we can do that, and I think the state has showed that kind of commitment. What, what about the effort that uh, Representative Ogren is, is pushing to make access to health insurance a part of our Constitution? Uh, what, what, 
is, is that a way to go to try to assure some of these things? I think there's a, you know, that's a larger issue, Ed, and it's, and it's one that needs to be dealt with and talked about very seriously. It's very clear that the accessibility to health care for all our citizens has declined rapidly. Small employers are finding they can't afford it because of the huge escalation in health care costs. My focus has been those folks least able to talk in the period I think most need and least able to see, search out for it by themselves, and, and that's pregnant mothers and kids from birth to age five. We've done, we've done increasingly a better job with our senior citizens. People live longer in Minnesota than anywhere else, and we got more and a larger percentage of our population as senior citizens, and we've really done a good job of caring for them, not as well as some folks would like. But it's zero to five. A, a baby can cry, but they can't articulate, I think I have this problem, I need the help. 14 to 16 year old moms don't understand it. Frankly, some 25 and 28 year old moms and dads don't understand either. And it seemed to me that if we reached first into the most needy and the most vulnerable and the least able to communicate, then we can see if we can move forward from then. I think I salute the, the, the efforts of, of Representative Ogren to, to raise that issue and to bring it to the forefront. I don't think constitutional amendments to provide answers to social policy without funding mechanisms are the answer. One of my responsibilities, I know it will come from my legislative colleagues, is Freeman, if you want to do this, where is the money going to come from? And one of the things I have to do is figure out where in the budget the money will come from. I, it seems to me the better way for Representative Ogren, those advocates, to do that is to come up with a funding source. Let's move legislatively, like I'm trying to do for kids, for the health care, because I'm not sure putting it in the Constitution is quite the right answer. Do you think people in Minnesota would uh, go for an income tax to pay for health services for kids and, and women? I think the people in the state of Minnesota have shown a real capacity to fund and to support programs. I think we need to frame issues, just that specifically. If this happens in our tax system, we will be able to do this. And, and I have great faith in the people in the state. When you frame issues like that, they can see for X you get Y, they'll do it. Um, and the problem is you get into a general fund and where is all this money and how does it come and where does it go and you know it's real easy to pick on tax increases it's real easy to spend money you don't have or try to spend it and it's much harder to raise the taxes and I think responsible people on both the sides of the political aisle recognize we need to do some things for kids and now we need to frame the issue so all the populace can see if we do this with your tax system then we can provide this service Mike, you've announced that you're not going to be running for re-election re to the Senate. You're instead running for Hennepin County Attorney. How do you see what you've been pushing in the legislature transferring should you win the election next fall? Well, and it was a hard decision, Gretchen. I've loved my eight years in the Minnesota Senate, and as far as I'm concerned, the women and the children's agenda is not over, but the chance to be Hennepin County Attorney is, is, a, is a great opportunity and a professional challenge, so I bit it off. And frankly, in, in thinking about that, the county does a great deal in terms of enforcing child support agreements. It does a great deal to help stop and enforce uh, child abuse and stop it and, and battered women's shelters in the prosecution of that. It seems to me that as we move forward, a county attorney can do a lot to make sure that kids are fed, kids do receive health care, and kids are supported economically by their, by their parents as they should be. We can also make sure that the kids who are in the care of their parents are receiving the kind of quality care they should. So if you told me 10 years ago that this would be a step forward in the women's and children's agenda, I'm not sure I would have agreed. But as I've learned about how important the judicial system is in the life of kids, um, I've been convinced that this is something that I ought to look at. How does that tie in with your agenda at the Minneapolis Health Department? <laughs> well, we certainly see that the uh, the county is very important in terms of all health and social services uh, for moms and kids and, and as Minneapolis is part of Hennepin County that's certainly going to be a, a critical issue and the, the, as you say the, the, the courts and the legal system interface a lot with the, the welfare system, the health system uh, so anybody that we can get in here who's sensitive to the needs of moms and kids is certainly going to be a, a step in the right direction both in terms of allocating resources in the, the big county government to moms and kids, uh, if we can get a little more resources in that area, that certainly would be helpful. You know, if you can make sure that people are paying the child support, then the mother doesn't have to be on the welfare system to surprise, supply the, either the health care or the food that a child needs. And what we've seen is 
increased poverty of children. We've certainly seen increased poverty of single moms with very small children. And so I think some of the things we're talking about in the 1990 legislative session will extend over into the, the county attorney's race because if we can make sure that we're collecting the dollars in the folks. It's kind of hard for me to see. Nothing's more important to me than my kids. And I can't imagine that wouldn't be the first check I write each month. But I also understand family circumstances and situations get to be difficult. And they, they kind of stop paying. Well, I don't think the taxpayers ought to pick up for a mother or father's responsibility. And we've got to help those folks do what I think they really want to do. Maybe, maybe we need to give them a little encouragement. And I think I can do that as county attorney. Or education, too. And more oh. education. You know, I, and I think a lot of things when, when, when folks are, when they're helped to be brought, when you take somebody to the woodshed and you give them their options about why don't you make up with your payments and pay them current and why don't you think about why you're doing what you're doing. Most folks want to do the right thing. Sometimes we just got to give them a little encouragement to do it. <laughs> and if they don't want to do the right thing, then we, then we, then we, uh, then we got uh, prisons and jails for that. And, uh, Major, vast majority of people want to do the right thing. We just kind of, kind of encourage them. Different sorts of encouragement. Yeah. Thank you both for being with us on All About Kids today. If we could go on for a long time about these issues. This has been wonderful. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Gretchen. It was great. Thanks to Ed Ellinger and Mike Freeman for being with us today. We appreciate their efforts to improve the quality of health care for Minnesota's women and young children. And thank you for joining us on All About Kids. Please tune in again. This has been a presentation of Hennepin County Library in conjunction with the Twin Cities Metropolitan Library Service Agency. We thank you for watching and we hope you visit your public library often.